Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the MOF 2024 webinar. This series of webinar is organized to introduce and promote the MOF 2024, the ninth International Conference on Metal Organic Frameworks and Open Framework Compounds to be held on the 15th to 19th July, 2024 in Singapore. So if your research is in the areas of uh, metal organic frameworks and the covalent organic frameworks, you should not miss this conference because uh, this conference has a focus on the recent advancements in MOFs, COFs, and other porous materials. Uh, it is uh, the most well-established conference in the field with close to two decades of history. Uh, the conference, uh, the series of international MOF conference started in 2008 in Germany and the 2010 uh, in France, 2012 in Edinburgh in UK, 2014 Kobe in Japan, 2016 Long Beach in USA, 2018 Auckland, New Zealand. Due to the COVID, the 2021 was held online. The previous one, 2022, was held in Dresden, Germany. And the next one, will be held in Singapore. Uh, we are very honored to be the hosting city for MOF 2024. As you may know, Singapore is a tropical uh, country, is a country city on the almost equator. However, you will be surprised that in July, Singapore might be cooler than most part of the world. And in Singapore, you can enjoy the beautiful botanic garden the beach, the zoo, the great food, the beautiful shopping center. So this is an excellent place, not only to enjoy science, but also to spend a good time with your family. The MOF 2024 conference uh, is organized uh, by Materials Research Society of Singapore and is supported by National University of Singapore, the Nanyang Technological University, the Singapore University of Technology and the Design, an agency for science, technology, and the research. We have in total five themes and topics, materials, fundamental phenomena and the properties, synthetic methods, characterizations, and last but not least, the applications and industrial integration. The conference will occupy a full week time we have a two-day pre-conference starting Saturday and Sunday, okay, on July the 13th to 14th. And uh, the opening ceremony of the main conference will be held on 15th of July, which is a Monday. And the main conference will last from 16th to 19th of July. And the closing ceremony will be held on 19th of July, which is Friday. We have uh, planned a venue that can accommodate more than 1,000 participants. We have two special speakers who are actually also the pioneers in the MOF area, Professor Suzumu Kitagawa from Kyoto University, who will be giving a plenary presentation during the pre-conference, and Professor Omayagi from UC Berkeley, who will be giving a plenary presentation during the gala dinner. And uh, we have, together with these two, we have eight plenary talks, 47 keynote presentations, more than 70 invited presentations. And we can accommodate more than 160 oral presentations and more than 650 posters. The conference has a very rich program, including not only pre-conference, but also editors and industry forums, the gala dinner, and social visits. I want to take the chance to introduce the editors forum. So far, we have invited editors of all the flagship journals from the society of different countries. For example, we have Professor Omar Yardi as an associate editor of JAX, the flagship of American Chemical Society. Dr. Lin Xiaohao, 
the managing editor of CCS Chemistry, the flagship journal of Chinese Chemical Society. Dr. Xin Su, the executive editor of Angavanti Chem, the flagship journal of German Chemical Society, and Dr. May Kopsi, the executive editor of Chemical Science, the flagship journal of Royal Society of Chemistry. Of course, besides the chemistry journals, we have also, we have also invited other editors. For example, myself, I am an executive editor of Industrial Engineering Chemistry Research, a journal published by American Chemical Society focusing on applied chemistry and chemical engineering. And we have also invited editors from Nature Portfolio. For example, Dr. Victoria Richard, she's the chief editor of Communications Chemistry, and Dr. Harry Gaddis, he's the editor of Nature Communications. We believe the discussion between the participants and the editors can be very helpful for you to prepare and submit your next manuscript. On top of the editor's forum, we have the industrial forum, and uh, we have invited active researchers, the industrial partners, and also the end users to come and share their thought and uh, outlook of MOPS. For example, we have a keynote speaker, Dr. DJ Liu. He's a senior chemist at Argonne National Lab. He is one of the pioneers in developing MOF derived electrocatalyst. We have Ben Hermandez. He's the founder and CEO of NewMed Technologies. Ray Odemir, CEO of Framelogy. Charles Toft, the CTO of Nova Moth. And Paul Kirkman, the R&D manager of Promission Particles. Those are very active um, pioneers and entrepreneurs in the Moth spin-off and startup companies. We have end users, Dr. Stephen Marks, the new business development of BSF, and Dr. Joseph Foxwalski, the research associate of ExxonMobil. So you can see that we have not only researchers, but also MOF technology providers and MOF technology end users. Together, we hope to close the loop and see the future development of the MOFs. Here, I want to share with you some abstract submission statistics. As of today, we have received more than 780 abstracts. So we are quite close to our target of 1,000 participants. A quarter of the abstract come from China. And beside China, we have, um, large pop we have large contributions from Germany, United States, Japan, United Kingdom, and India. This will be indeed a international conference. We have confirmed participants of more than 40 countries and regions. The majority of the submit abstracts uh, focus on theme one, the materials. The second one is the theme five, applications and industrial integration. So you can see those will be the two most popular themes in the MOF 2024. You're gonna see not only fundamental research on materials, but more excitingly, how those materials can be applied and show their value in practical applications. Here are some important dates. We have extended the abstract submission deadline to February the 15th. So we have about uh, 10 days. If you decided to come and haven't submit your abstract yet, please do so. You will be notified of your abstract submission outcome in March, and uh, the early bird registration deadline is in the middle of April. If you have decided to come, we recommend you to register as early as possible to enjoy a discount rate and also to secure your accommodation and flight. So please join us. You can learn more about uh, the MOF 2024 through the website, and we have, uh, we have Twitter and uh, WeChat as our social platforms. Feel free to follow and join us. So before we start today's webinar, uh, please allow me to um, introduce our next webinar. Our next webinar will be given by Professor 
Bang Lin Chen from Fujian Normal University, uh, which will be held on 5th of March. And the time is 3 p.m. Singapore time. And the title is Our Journey of Exploring Multifunctional Metal Organic Framework and Hydrogen Bonded Organic Framework Materials. So please stay tuned. So let me introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Catherine Mirica from Dartmouth College. So Catherine was born and raised in Ukraine and immigrated with her family to the United States as she was starting high school. She obtained her bachelor in chemistry at Boston College, where she developed a passion for materials chemistry, working in the laboratory of Larry Scott. She earned her PhD in chemistry from Harvard University under the guidance of George Whiteside and completed her postdoc training with Tim Swage at MIT. Catherine began her independent scientific career as an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at Dartmouth College in July 2015 and was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2021. As of 2022, she has been serving as an associate editor of ACS Sensors. Um, this is a great uh, journal published by ACS. Excellent editors, professional reviewers, huge impact, highly recommended. So without further ado, uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Professor Zhao. I'm delighted to be here and have the opportunity to tell you a bit about the work that my group has been doing at Dartmouth College for the past eight years or so. So the talk today will be focused on the major thrust within my group focused on molecular engineering of conductive framework materials for chemical sensing, filtration, and detoxification. So one of the major goals in my group is to achieve uh, innovation in chemical detection in the age of information. And here we look to capitalize on the portable electronic devices that many of us now carry in our pockets to make an impact in personalized healthcare and also personal uh, protection. And here we build uh, upon functional materials that can be integrated into very portable electroanalytical systems. These are some examples of what has been recently achieved in electroanalytical applications. We can now have electronic tattoos that can measure heart rate, temperature, and strain. We can also have wearable wristband type watch devices that can measure chemicals such as ions that are released in sweat and uh, glucose and lactate that correlate with human exertion during exercise, for example. And we can also have eyeglasses that can collect sweat from the human nose and then also measure other analytes such as ions and uh, small molecules such as uh, glucose and lactate as well. Uh, but in all these devices, uh, they rely on very traditional carbon-based electrodes or metal-based electrodes to achieve their sensing function. And there are a couple of problems associated with that. First of all, these types of electrode systems, in order to achieve chemical detection, need to be post-synthetically functionalized with either ionophore for the detection of ions or uh, small molecules or um, enzymes for the detection of other analytes. And that creates heterogeneous interfaces with some limited chemical stability that can be prone to delamination in practical applications. And then a second limitation of these systems is that these systems are not easily amenable to analytes that cannot be detected with very well established post-synthetic functionalization strategies in terms of biomedically relevant sensitivity and selectivity. So if we want to go beyond the common analytes that we can currently detect with these portable electroanalytical systems, we need to seek other materials that can bring about new function and enable new types of detection schemes. 
So what might be we interested in detecting that is not so straightforward to do in a portable wearable format, format currently with existing technology? Well, my group is particularly interested in the class of gases known as gasotransmitters. These are basically three gases, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, and hydrogen sulfide, that are toxic by inhalation. They're toxic at part per million exposure limits. But they're also produced in biological systems to regulate a number of important physiological functions. And these functions range from blood pressure regulation to immune response and possibly also learning and memory. But due to some of the challenges in the detection of these gases, we don't have a full picture and a full understanding of exactly what these gases do in biological systems. And some of the challenges associated with the detection of these gases have to do with their broad concentration ranges in biological systems, uh, in the blood ranging from nanomolar to millimolar. But these gases also partition in exhaled air and can also be detected in the gas phase from exhaled air as well. But then another challenge with the detection is also short half-lives of these gases. So in order for sensors to be relevant, we need them to be quite fast, working in the regime of seconds to minutes. So the long-term goal of my group is to enable biologically relevant detection of these gases, either in exhaled air or directly in biological fluids. And that could potentially enable better understanding of some of the diseases that are associated with misregulations of these gases in biological systems. But because these gases are also toxic by inhalation and constitute important health hazards and environmental hazards, we also hope that the technology that we develop could be relevant for environmental monitoring and smart personal protective equipment that can protect wearers against the toxic exposure to these gases. So the way we tackle that goal is by developing novel mon multifunctional conductive framework materials and also developing methods for the integration of these materials into electronic textiles focusing particularly on strategies of self-assembly. And with these uh, strategies in mind, we've been able to demonstrate in our group uh, the ability to detect toxic gases as well as neurochemicals and ions, and also demonstrate the potential of these materials and their composites with textiles for filtration and detoxification. So the way we view our materials design for this application is uh, as being bio-inspired. So we don't try to mimic biology, but we definitely take inspiration from molecularly precise structures in biology, such as proteins that have embedded molecular recognition subunits within organized hierarchical structures. And some of these proteins, such as guanylate cyclase, are really good at binding and differentiating small reactive gases from each other, such as nitric oxide from carbon monoxide. And they, they typically achieve that through a change in shape. In our materials chemistry design, we rely on rigid, structurally rigid materials, such as metal organic frameworks and covalent organic frameworks, that also have very well-defined molecular recognition subunits embedded within that rigid material structure. But unlike changing their shape, these materials can change their properties in response to their chemical environment. And something that we're particularly excited about in this realm is the ability to change electronic properties of these materials uh, in response to the chemical environment, such as conductivity, work function, or dielectric constant. And that is because we see that uh, as being very uh, straightforward to couple to information technology and portable electronic devices that can read out changes in those electrical properties of the materials. And so with that in mind, we can then read out uh, the 
changes in electrical properties in a very portable, low power electronic device that can ultimately potentially enable healthcare monitoring, industrial safety, and promote environmental stewardship related to these toxic, but also biologically relevant gases that I discussed. So we work a lot with metal organic frameworks in our group. And while there are many advantages of these materials for a variety of applications, I want to zero in specifically on the conductive two-dimensional organic metal organic frameworks in the context of their beneficial properties in the realm of electroanalysis. So we basically view these as designer two-dimensional materials that are similar in a way to graphite, which can be exfoliated or grown into graphene, single layer type devices. Here, there's also potential to do that uh, with this intrinsically conductive extended framework structure that can give us a really uh, well-defined, molecularly precise surface where analytes can bind and change the electronic properties of these materials. So in the context of electroanalysis, one of the really valuable properties is this intrinsically conductive, chemically precise extended structure. The chemical precision is really valuable for understanding structure property relationships, but also the fact that this material can be assembled from the bottom up through the process of self-assembly and coordination chemistry gives us bottom-up control over those structure property relationships. And the intrinsic conductivity that is embedded in this material by design through deep high conjugation of the ligands and the metals that are used to construct the framework, as well as through the through space overlap, orbital overlap of these stacked layers, is really, really beneficial for electronic transduction and actuation of chemical information. So when something binds to the surface, that binding event can be transduced as a change in electronic properties of the material. Another really important benefit of these structures is the permanent porosity that is embedded within a rigid structure. So we have high surface area, which is great for increased intermolecular interactions when we're trying to do sensing. And we also have high volumetric capacity, which is important when we're trying to uptake and sense gases within these materials. Additionally, we have this uh, modular structure that results from the metal ligand interactions. And that modular structure can determine the multifunctionality of the material. Uh, combining this uh, modular structure with the properties of porosity, we can enable uh, not just sensing, uh, but filtration and detoxification. And the modularity also enables reconfigurable surface chemistry and reactivity through the principles of molecular design. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of using conductive metal organic frameworks and covalent organic frameworks for electroanalytical applications. These materials are really modular, as I mentioned. By starting with different ligands, we can obtain different structures with different topology, different porosity, and different active sites. And then by placing these structures into different electronic devices, we can enable various kinds of detection mechanisms that are basically orthogonal to each other and can enable these materials to have multifunctional performance. So today my talk will focus primarily on using these materials in a chemoresistive device architecture where we're going to measure the output of the device using amperometry, so changes in current. But we also have demonstrated the ability to use these conductive metal organic frameworks as working electrodes in voltammetry for the detection of neurochemicals, for example, redox active analytes. And also in some of our other work, we've demonstrated the ability to use these materials as ion to electron transducers in potentiometry and enable detection of ions. So the point here is that depending on what kind of device architecture we place these materials into, we can get a very different readout um, from these materials enabling multifunctionality. 
A really useful feature of some of these conductive metal organic frameworks is that they're really straightforward to make. And the synthesis results in a very robust water and air stable framework materials. So for example, starting with a hexahydroxy triphenylene ligand, which is commercially available, and reacting it with metal acetate salts in water under air, we can obtain this conductive porous framework material using basically the original or slightly modified conditions that were developed by Omar Yagi during the first report of these framework materials in 2012. We can do this with graduate students, undergraduates, as well as high school students in my laboratory. And once the synthesis is complete, we can see nanowire morphologies of these materials precipitate from solution. These nanowires are conductive and porous. And if we sonicate them, we can achieve exfoliation and visualize thin layers of these materials with their hexagonal porosity using transmission electron microscopy. Now, placing these materials uh, into devices can take a variety of forms and approaches. So I want to start with one of the simplest approaches that my group has implemented by directly growing conductive metal organic frameworks on shrinkable polymer films. So this is a very simple device architecture where we can simply draw graphitic electrodes on a shrinkable polymer film. This is just a pre-stretched polystyrene. And we reasoned that this would have a couple of advantages for device fabrication. One, the use of a shrinkable polymer film allows us to quickly, rapidly, and inexpensively fabricate interdigitated electrodes with patterns that can be obtained after shrinking this pre-stretched polystyrene into form factors that are highly miniaturized on millimeter scale that would be difficult to draw by hand, but we're using a, a very straightforward fabrication technique. Second, we reasoned that by implementing these graphitic electrodes in our device, we could achieve good ohmic contact of the framework materials, which are semiconductive in nature, uh, to this graphitic electrode, basically promoting good electronic connection between the electrode and the device that we're using for sensing. So our electrodes fabricated by this method are in basically feature size of uh, about 100 to 300 microns. And then we can take this electrode chip and simply dip it into the solution phase uh, precursors of the metal organic framework and allow the framework to grow directly into the device. So this is our electrode wire as imaged by electron microscopy. As we allow the synthesis to proceed using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we see incorporation of the elements of the framework materials that we're growing on top and bridging these interdigitated electrodes. We're utilizing hexahydroxy triphenylene based framework materials with copper or nickel metal. And we see characteristic features of those metals being incorporated into nanowire like morphologies on films that are about 15 micrometers thick on these devices. And then to probe the function of these devices, we place them into a chemoresistive device architecture. So this is simply just a two electrode device. In this particular case, these are the interdigitated electrodes that are bridged with the active sensing material. In this case, that's our framework material. So what we do here is simply apply voltage, constant voltage, and measure current. And we look at changes of current that result from the exposure of the sensing material to the gaseous analyte. So our raw data looks something like this. It's a current versus time plot that changes upon analyte exposure. And as analyte stream is removed, that's being flown over the surface of the device, we can see some recovery. Now this recovery phase can be informative. What you're seeing on the slide is a partial recovery, uh, often corresponding to partially reversible interactions. Uh, but this recovery can be completely reversible or completely dosimetric. And typically that recovery process can be informative for inferring the kinds of intermolecular interactions or chemistry that may be going on on the surface of the material during the sensing process. 
So we take take this raw data of current versus time, and we typically convert it and normalize it into relative uh, changes in conductance that we plot in such a way that they're proportional to resistance. So when you see this vertical axis labeled as so, just think of that as resistance changes. So in this particular case, the resistance increases upon exposure to the analyte, and then we see partial, partial recovery with analyte removal. So let's take a look at some real data for two different framework materials, both with hexahydroxytriphenylene ligand, but interconnected with different metals, copper or nickel. So the metal is, diff is different, the ligand is the same. And we're exposing these materials in the chemoresistive device architecture to three different gases, ammonia, nitric oxide, and hydrogen sulfide. So I talked about the importance of gasotransmitters such as nitric oxide and hydrogen sulfide. Those are our main targets. But ammonia is also an important toxic gas and common biological interferent uh, for these target gases as well. So that's why we're looking at that. So I want to draw your attention to several important features emerging from this data. So first, we see a concentration-dependent response upon exposure to these gases. From this concentration-dependent response, we can derive limits of detection for these sensing devices, which are in the low part per million range for nitric oxide and hydrogen sulfide. Second, we see different response of different materials to uh, various gases. So let's uh, take a look at nickel hexahydroxytriphenylene versus copper hexahydroxytriphenylene as they respond to ammonia. We see a reversible response for the copper-based material towards ammonia, but essentially no response of the nickel-based material towards ammonia. So there's some selective response, and that can be useful for differentiation of gases. Moreover, there's another important feature of, of the data here that is related to the directionality of response. So we actually see resistance decreasing in response to nitric oxide and resistance increasing in response to hydrogen sulfide and ammonia for the material that responds. That is a typical feature of a P-type semiconductor that becomes more conductive or decreases its resistance in response to an oxidizing gas and increases its resistance in response to a reducing gas. So this type of exposure to these gases also tells us something about the semiconductive nature of the materials that we're studying. We can take all this data and process it using principal component analysis and demonstrate that we can achieve not only detection, but differentiation of these gases from each other. So we can differentiate nitric oxide from hydrogen sulfide, from ammonia, as well as from water vapor, uh, which uh, bodes well for the possibility of using these sensors down the road in some kind of practical applications where an array of several sensors together, even though each of the sensors is basically cross-reactive, but the array together can achieve differentiation of these gases from each other. Now, in my group, we're interested in building practical devices, but we're also interested in fundamental understanding of material analyte interactions that lead to the observed chemoresistive response. So in order to gain insight into those material analyte interactions, we carried out a number of spectroscopic investigations to see how signal transduction is coupled to spectroscopic signatures of binding or various chemical interactions on the surfaces of these materials. So first, let's take a look at ammonia. In our devices, we have metal bis dioxaline linkages in the devices that I've looked at so far, where X is oxygen. And we envisioned that in these types of interactions, we may be uh, able to have Lewis acid interactions where the analyte can interact directly with the metal site of the framework material, as shown here, uh, but also bronsted acid interactions uh, if the water um, ligands are present uh, on the surface of this material 
and are coordinated to the metal centers, then we can have bronzed acid interactions. And then both of these types of interactions, Lewis acid or bronzed acid, can be visualized as being on the surface of the material, so on the basal plane or on the edge sites. But because we're in the nanowire morphology from the scanning electron micrographs that I showed earlier, likely actually the edge sites dominate. And because many of our devices are also randomly oriented networks of these framework crystallites, likely the junctions between crystallites and these edge sites is what's dominating the sensing response. So using diffuse reflectance infrared spectroscopy, as well as other techniques such as electron paramagnetic resonance, what we conclude about the nature of interactions of these hexahydroxytriphenylene based framework materials is that there's a presence of both uh, bronzed acid sites and Lewis acid sites, but that in the case of these hydroxy uh, linked systems, the uh, bronzed acid sites uh, can, can be significant and there's no dehydration of these materials that is observed um, upon binding. So no, no water release during binding for these particular materials. So um, both bronzed acid sites and Lewis acid sites are present, uh, but there is an important distinction between the copper-based material and the nickel-based material, uh, less so in the binding regime, but more so in the electron paramagnetic resonance, where for the nickel-based materials, we don't see any changes in redox activity of either the ligand or the metal. But in the case of the copper-based materials, we actually see a shift in redox states of the copper metal that starts out as being mixed valency type of copper. So a mixture of copper one and copper two that shifts significantly towards more copper two population upon exposure to ammonia, which upon binding we hypothesize can stabilize this higher oxidation state of the metal and potentially lead to a metal to ligand charge transfer that ultimately leads to the observed chemiresistive response for the copper-based material and the lack of chemiresistive response for the nickel-based material. So for the nickel-based material, it's not that there's no binding, but upon that binding, there isn't a significant redox shift or changes uh, or perturbations to the electronic properties of the material that in contrast for the copper material are observed very strongly. So basically our um, picture is beginning to emerge where upon binding of ammonia to the surface of the framework, some of the materials are able to transduce that binding event through changes in their redox uh, states of the constituents of the framework, while others do not. In terms of interactions with nitric oxide, using diffuse reflectance infrared spectroscopy and X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, what we conclude is that nitric oxide is actually getting oxidized on the surface of the framework, primarily to nitrate species upon binding, although we do also see some direct binding of NO to the copper centers within the framework. Importantly, the structure of the framework is maintained and the framework remains crystalline even upon exposure to 10,000 parts per million concentration of nitric oxide. Upon interactions with hydrogen sulfide, what we actually see using the same kinds of spectroscopic techniques is the presence of sulfur zero species as well as metal sulfide such as copper sulfide in the case of the copper-based framework. The crystallinity of the framework is also retained, but upon these high exposure, uh, high concentrations of exposure, we do see some uh, diminished intensities of the diffraction peaks corresponding to some framework breakdown, but also indicative peaks of copper sulfide formation, which is important uh, to um, support supports that uh, mechanistic observation. Um, so our devices are not limited to these polymer-based films, and using the same strategies of self-assembly, we've also been able to place these framework materials 
onto textile substrates uh, with the goal of obtaining very lightweight, porous, and wearable sensor technologies with these materials. So in order to achieve growth of the framework materials on the textile substrate, we can use the same in situ hydrothermal growth technique by performing the reaction in the presence of the precursors of the metal organic framework. This allows us to achieve conformal coating of cellulose fibers by the metal organic framework crystallites and gives us devices with very good mechanical stability. We can bend these, we can twist them, we can flatten them out, and their conductivity is not significantly perturbed by those mechanical perturbations. And we believe that to be due to the fact that we're well above the percolation threshold of charge through this composite material due to very tight packing of the metal organic framework crystallites on the textile substrate. To probe the sensing function of these textile devices, we can place them into a custom made enclosure and flow gases over their surface and observe the response. So in this case, we're exposing two different framework materials. The one in blue is uh, a nickel-based framework interconnected with nitrogen-based uh, uh, heteroatomic crosslinkers all relying on the hexahydroxytriphenylene ligand that I've shown before. And the one in red is interconnected with oxygens, so metal bis dioxaline types of linkages. So let me draw your attention to some important features of this data. Again, we're able to obtain the concentration dependent response. Uh, this concentration dependent response allows us to derive limits of detection for these materials that are now in sub part per million range, which is very exciting for practical utility of these sensors and their applicability to environmental monitoring or personal protective equipment. Second, we also see differences in the directionality of the response for different materials. So the material in red becomes uh, basically more conductive, so decreases its resistance in response to nitric oxide, whereas the material in blue responds in the opposite direction. In response to H2S, both of these materials respond in the same direction, increasing their resistance in response to this reducing gas. So the material in red is acting like a typical P-type semiconductor, but the material in blue may be a mixed type or more of an N-type semiconductor, which is consistent with some other studies that others have shown for the properties of this material. So this difference in the directionality of the response and the concentration dependent response is useful because we can take this two sensor textile array and then perform principal component analysis, showing that we can achieve differentiation of these gases from each other at part per million concentrations, as well as from the water vapor. But what's also important is that the sensor performance is uncompromised uh, in the presence of humidity. So when we humidify our gas stream more than 10 times over the concentrations of the analytes, that we're looking at. So this is all done at around 20% humidity, so close to 5,000 part per million concentration of water. We see that the performance is effectively unchanged in the presence of humidity, which could be useful for practical applications down the road. But perhaps one of the most remarkable and unique features of these textile-based devices compared to devices on solid substrates is that we can flow gases not just over the surface of these devices, but through them and achieve detection, capture, and filtration of these gaseous analytes. So for example, if we put two devices in series and then flow the gas stream through that device assembly, we can demonstrate that the response of the second sensor is attenuated by the presence of the first. So the first sensor begins responding right away upon encountering this gas. That's the solid line in these uh, data plots that I'm showing. But the onset of the response of the second sensor is delayed because the first sensor is not just sensing the analyte, but it's uptaking it, filtering it, and only permits it to go through once some breakthrough capacity has been reached.
And so that can be qualitatively demonstrated by putting these devices in series. We have also uh, developed other methods of textile integration of metal organic frameworks. This particular method was serendipitously discovered by uh, one of my group members, Michael Coe, and then uh, significantly developed by another graduate student, Aileen Eagleton. So in this particular method, what we do is pre-deposit solid copper metal onto a textile substrate and then restructure it under oxidative conditions in the presence of oxygen, uh, also in the presence of ligand in water into the metal organic framework. And so this gives us conductive electronic textiles with metal organic frameworks embedded on the surface of the textiles, but also very good orientational uh, direction of the metal organic framework crystallites on the textile substrate and very good adhesion that is likely promoted by chemical interactions such as hydrogen bonding to the surface of the textile of the MOF, um, as well as mechanical interlocking of the metal organic framework crystallites into the textile fiber, which we can see uh, from this focused ion beam image. So the crystals kind of penetrate into the fiber and basically lock themselves in place. You can see the diffraction patterns from the framework uh, material on the textile that correspond uh, to the structural features of the framework. And instead of uh, typical conductive coatings that often make the textile substrate less porous, what we see is actually a tenfold increase in surface area for the cotton substrate after it is coated with the uh, framework crystallites because the framework itself being porous adds uh, microporosity to, to the textile substrate. What's really cool about this particular technique is that it enables patterning. We can take the pattern of the metal that can be deposited on the surface of the textile using thermal evaporation and then restructure it under these very mild conditions into the metal organic framework that retains the pattern of the original metal. This works uh, not just on demonstrations of letters, uh, but also in device architectures such as these interdigitated electrodes that can uh, be patterned on a textile substrate. The technique is not limited to only cotton. It works on other natural fibers such as silk, as well as synthetic fibers on uh, nylon and polyester, as well as non-woven substrates such as paper. And we think that taken together, uh, this broad applicability could result in technical clothing development, smart personal protective equipment development, smart sutures, smart bandages, smart filtration membranes, and possibly also low cost diagnostic type devices on the surface of paper. Uh, this method also gives us a very good sensing performance in low part per million concentration uh, uh, regime with uh, limits of detection in low part per million for hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide. Um, and then this study we've actually also characterized the breakthrough capacity of the copper hexahydroxy triphenylene material, which is able to uptake H2S at 4.6 moles per kilogram um, and retains uh, a significant fraction of its functional performance, even in the presence of 80% humidity. This material turns out to also be quite good at uh, water uptake capacity, but that doesn't hurt it significantly or doesn't fully destroy its performance against uh, H2S filtration. But perhaps what is most exciting to us about this particular textile integration strategy is that the framework material that's deposited on the textile using this method is extremely robust. So we can put this material through a variety of physical and chemical tests and demonstrate that it still maintains its sensing ability to hydrogen sulfide even after heating, abrasion, ironing, and uh, chemical washes in detergent, concentrated peroxide, and bleach. And not only that, we can also cycle the sensing performance of these uh, electronic textiles in response to H2S, and the sensing 
uh, function is maintained. It's best maintained uh, in detergent washes. In peroxide and bleach, over multiple cycles, the framework does begin to degrade and the copper ion does begin to leach out. So we do have to be careful in terms of how we wash it, but detergent-based and water-based washes are totally fine for this particular electronic textile. So the important thing here to emphasize is also that even though the performance of our sensors is dosimetric, meaning that they don't recover after exposure to H2S on their own, and we cannot promote that recoverability by just heating or vacuum, we can actually recover these devices by washing, and they still continue to perform after multiple washes. So one question that my group asked is, how does this conversion process of copper to copper containing metal organic framework is actually occurring under these very simple and mild conditions, simply in the presence of organic ligand, oxygen, and water. And after some pondering, what we realized is that this conversion process may be actually quite similar conceptually to the chemistry of copper patina formation that occurs on surfaces uh, such as the one shown here, Statue of Liberty, that basically takes copper and leads to ultimately its oxidation under um, uh, air uh, and promotes formation of passivating minerals that form on the surface that promote uh, stability of that structure and prevent further corrosion. And some of these minerals include malachite, azurite, brackenite that give that copper patina its characteristic blue-green color. So actually at Dartmouth, we have this beautiful library uh, centrally located on our campus. And when I started as a faculty member here on campus, um, this library has undergone a roof replacement project. So I had the fortune to basically watch uh, the weathering of this roof occur over time. And what happens in this process is that copper goes to various oxide forms. Uh, so cuprous oxide, cupric oxide, and then ultimately incorporation of carbon dioxide in the form of carbonate and sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide in the form of sulfate to form these minerals. So perhaps over time we will achieve um, the full passivation of the surface and the patina formation, but we're still in the development stage of this chemistry here on campus. Of course, uh, this process takes years and can take decades uh, when the air quality is particularly good and there's not a lot of CO2 and sulfur uh, species in the air. But as chemists, we can control our chemistry. And so in our case, we can put the right ingredients to promote uh, the right kinetics that favor deposition of the framework material on the surface of the textile in the pattern where the copper used to be pre-deposited. So our mechanistic proposal is as follows. We actually have to achieve the oxidation of the linker into this monoradical trisemiquinone state in order to coordinate that ligand with the metal ion to obtain a charge neutral framework. And then that framework uh, can grow and deposit in the location where the copper metal was pre-deposited if there's a high effective concentration of the copper ions at the surface of the textile. If this oxidation of the copper metal is too fast, we can promote precipitation of the framework as opposed to deposition onto the textile. And in fact, that is what can occur in non-optimized conditions where the concentrations of the reacting species have not been optimized. Okay, so, so far I talked about uh, electronic textiles and uh, sensing materials. And uh, what we've been able to achieve is a really good performance of these materials in textile devices. Uh, and what I want to do now in just uh, the last few minutes is to give you a highlight that goes beyond this triphenylene-based materials uh, that, while useful for achieving composite materials with textiles capable of sensing filtration and detoxification and new methods of electronic textile fabrication, does have limitations in 
performance in terms of limit of the detection of the material. So in order to extend the limit of the detection uh, to more biologically relevant concentrations, we employed a thiocyanine containing framework material that uh, we reasoned can act as an additional active site to extend the limit of detection of our analytes while maintaining the metal bis dioxaline node that has already served us in the part per million concentration regime, but potentially help us reach into the part per billion concentration regime by adding another receptor that couples into this framework material in the chemiresistive device architecture. So with that in mind, we went after the synthesis of this bimetallic thalocyanine containing metal organic framework material, which we have been able to achieve with um, the leadership of a fantastic postdoc in my group, Zhang Meng, uh, taking octahydroxy thalocyanine and interconnecting this ligand with either copper or nickel nodes gives us crystalline framework materials that now have uh, the metal thalocyanine. This, this is, in this case, this is the nickel-based thalocyanine interconnected with those nodes. These materials form chunk-like crystallites and can be exfoliated by sonication where their square uh, pores are visualized by transmission electron microscopy. These materials are moderately conductive in the realm of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 Siemens per centimeter, which is just about the sweet spot for chemoresistive detection of gases in these interdigitated electrode types of devices. So with applied voltages of 1 volt or below, we can demonstrate chemoresistive detection of hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide, but in this case, our limits of detection are improved by orders of magnitude over what we were previously able to achieve with other materials. And we attribute this significantly to the molecular design of the thalocyanin containing building block. Looking at structure property relationships of these materials and comparing them to each other allows us to make conclusions about the importance of certain structural elements within the framework. For example, the copper containing uh, copper linked framework materials give us better performance towards hydrogen sulfide, whereas the nickel containing materials um, or nickel linked materials don't perform as well. In response to nitric oxide, we get the best performance with the nickel thalocyanin base framework that is linked with nickel. We can also probe um, another parameter, such as the porosity of the framework, by extending the structure of the thalocyanin to the naphthalocyanin and making an isoreticular analog with larger pores for this framework material. What we find is that in the case of hydrogen sulfide, the performance, the sensing performance of the thalocyanin and the naphthalocyanin are completely comparable for both the copper link systems and the nickel link systems. For nitric oxide, actually the thalocyanin based material gives us better performance. Um, and so this may, may be linked to porosity, but also may be linked to the just the extended structure of the material and the changes in electronic properties. Anyway, taking all these materials together and their response in sensing devices and performing principal component analysis allows us to achieve not only detection, but also differentiation of these gases from each other at part per million concentrations. Now I talked about concentrations uh, and detection of hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide, but another gas transmitter that I mentioned in the beginning is carbon monoxide. So in order to uh, achieve detection of carbon monoxide, we decided to compare two different bimetallic thalocyanin containing framework materials with the nickel center and the cobalt center. Excuse me. Okay. So we synthesized these framework materials and characterized them using by electron microscopy, and then proceeded to study their function um, using chemoresistive device architectures. So what we find is actually really good sensitivity towards carbon monoxide. We're able to detect 
part per million concentrations of these gases with limits of detection that is just about sub part per million. The uh, sensing persists in the presence of air and water. So this can work in practical detection environment. And we actually have a very, very good sensitivity and the linear range towards carbon monoxide in concentrations that are relevant for its environmental monitoring. The interactions of carbon monoxide with the framework materials are basically binding to the metal centers, but not necessarily we ex where we expected them to be. The carbon monoxide interacts predominantly with the copper center of the framework material, um, as opposed to the with the metallothalocyanin containing moiety. And what we believe the metallothalocyanin containing moiety is doing is tuning the electronic properties of the material itself, um, and basically tuning the uh, the electron density around the copper. Uh, metal uh, that's promoting the binding to a different extent. So uh, these materials also show selectivity. We can show that depending on the different structural features, we get different magnitude of response to carbon monoxide with the cobalt thalocyanin giving us the highest performance. And again, by looking at an array of multiple materials and doing principal component analysis, we can achieve not just detection, but differentiation of CO from other oxide type gases such as NO2 and nitric oxide. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention is that because we're interested in structure property relationships of these framework materials, we decided to go beyond metal organic frameworks and really look at the role of the node that uh, we believe to be beneficial uh, in the sensing uh, realm of these materials towards gasotransmitters. So in order to uncouple the role of the thalocyanin and the metal bisdioxaline linkage, we also looked at a covalent organic framework analog that is interconnected with pyrazine linkages and eliminates the second binding metal site, allowing us to just isolate the function of the thalocyanin subunit within the framework. So we embarked on the synthesis of this covalent organic framework analog, which we believed would be conductive due to the full conjugated linkages of this framework material, but also due to the stacking that we observed of this material of the individual layers in an eclipsed fashion. The bottleneck to the synthesis of this material is the synth synthesis of the ligand, this octaamino thalocyanin uh, based ligand, which we're able to uh, perform for the nickel based derivative. And upon obtaining this, uh, we're able to achieve a condensation of pyrene tetraone with the nickel octaamino thalocyanin to give us this novel framework material, which we named for Dartmouth College. So that's DC. The bulk conductivity of this conductive um, framework material is in the realm of 10 to the minus five Siemens per centimeter. Uh, and it gives a reasonably good diffraction in uh, PXRD. Uh, it presents itself as a rod-like morphology, which can also be exfoliated and visualized in transmission electron microscopy. But perhaps some of the most exciting and remarkable features of this conductive covalent organic framework in comparison to the metal organic frameworks that I showed is its exceptional thermal stability in comparison to the MOFs, as well as the precursors from which the framework grows. And also uh, the fact that uh, the structural fidelity of the material is preserved even in the concentrated uh, base and concentrated acid. The chemoresistive response of this framework material actually takes a hit in response to hydrogen sulfide, but maintains the performance in response to nitric oxide. So we are able to still achieve part per billion sensitivity to nitric oxide, but the sensitivity to H2S is diminished compared to the MOF materials that I showed earlier. So taking all of that data together, we can now 
make some conclusions that for the detection of hydrogen sulfide, the copper-based node is really important for enhancing performance and sensitivity. But for nitric oxide, actually, this covalent organic framework achieves really good performance in magnitudes and changes in response that are thousands of percent. So the cough for the detection of nitric oxide seems to give superior performance and may be significantly beneficial. And that may be due to the interaction of the nitric oxide with the thalassinine moiety, but also to the engagement of the organic portion of the framework. Okay. So to conclude, I talked today about various conductive porous framework materials for chemical sensing, uh, and we can use metal organic frameworks and covalent organic frameworks for chemoresistive detection to obtain highly sensitive and selective detection of small reactive gases, such as hydrogen sulfide, nitric oxide, and carbon monoxide. We have done that mainly using amperometry based on the data, data that I've shown here today. But if you're also interested in checking out other applicability of conductive MOFs in voltammetry and potentiometry, I invite you to check out our group website um, and look at those papers. So to summarize, we have demonstrated ability for small reactive gases at sub per million concentrations with a highly modular system and that is amenable to arrays for achieving selectivity. One of the main uh, advantages of the system is the low power consumption and low driving voltages that we have that we need to apply in order to uh, drive the performance of the devices. We have operation at room temperature, and we only require micrograms of the framework material that's that are needed for the device. And we get good performance of these sensors in the presence of humidity, and in some cases also in the presence of air as well. But perhaps the future of these framework materials uh, can really benefit from the design and the development of new conductive framework material analogs. Some of the early examples of conductive framework materials were demonstrated in 2009, and these two-dimensional systems have emerged around uh, 2012. But since then, we've really had a significant growth in the chemical diversity of conductive layered two-dimensional framework materials. And that structural evolution of those materials is perhaps only limited by our imagination and also the synthetic accessibility of these materials. But by looking at these new materials, we can perhaps obtain new function, not just in sensing, but in other realms of performance as well. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to conclude and thank my group. They're a fantastic group of people to work with, and I'm really grateful for their hard work and dedication to our research. I'd like to thank the funding sources that have supported our group uh, over the years. And thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for this uh, fantastic and uh, comprehensive uh, talk. So here comes the most exciting part of the Q&A. Uh, we have, uh, uh, by the way, uh, for the audience, if you want to have any, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A and just uh, type in your question here. And we have two questions. I can start with those two. And uh, I also have uh, a list of questions of my own. So Catherine, maybe <laughs> uh, we can discuss that later. So Sherman asked a question, when synthesizing a MOF, is it possible to orient its properties for the specific recognition of a target compound during adsorption or electrochemical detection among several with similar structures? So I think, okay, so if I could just repeat the question, I, I think the question is uh, aiming at, can we design the properties of the material for kind of targeted detection? Is that um, like a, hopefully that's a reasonable interpretation. So that's, that's yeah. the question that I will answer. So um, in terms of targeted structure property design, 
uh, I think some of the work that has been done in this area has been largely empirical, where we probe a certain structural feature and we make analogs and then ma we make comparisons and we see how the properties are altered. So what we learned from that is yes, absolutely, it is possible to tailor the properties to enhance uh, selectivity and sensitivity towards gases. As I've shown, some of our copper containing materials have enhanced detection towards hydrogen sulfide, which is sort of not surprising because of the metal ligand interactions and the kinds of chemistry that those materials can undergo compared to like nickel containing materials. So definitely we can tune the structure and tune the properties. But as we do that, we tune other parameters of the system as well, like potentially it's electronic transport, band gap, other features. And those fundamental studies are ongoing and there are some uh, nice published papers that are uh, uh, have been coming out in that realm as well. Uh, there was also this word of orientation within the question. And so the orientation of the material within the device also matters and there have been efforts in that as well, uh, in terms of the studies of transport of these materials, as well as making thin films, which definitely give enhanced performance as well. So there's properties of the material and properties of the device that both can be tuned to enhance performance. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, next question, uh, uh, Shivaranjit asked, uh, what about the selectivity? Uh, are they selective to target analytes? I assume they means the MOFs and COFs that you have demonstrated. Yes, that is a great question. So the question of selectivity is a really important one. And I think there's at least two ways to deal with it. And those are some of the approaches that we're pursuing. So the current materials that I have shown are to some extent cross-reactive. So they respond to multiple gases at the same time, but they respond to some stronger than others based on their chemical composition and surface properties. And so that kind of uh, cross-reactivity can be very well harnessed in a medium-sized array uh, that basically acts as an electronic nose and is capable of pattern recognition of functional groups or differentiation of gases from each other. So that's one approach that we're taking. We're now making arrays of these materials to achieve actually differentiation and selectivity. The other way to tackle the challenge of selectivity is actually to design highly selective materials, kind of like enzyme-like materials that promote very good selectivity. And that could be based on the surface interactions uh, in a 2D material, as I've shown, um, and those strategies are showing promise as well in our group. Uh, but ultimately, also, for, for most selective systems, it would be beneficial to harness sterics as well, so kind of three-dimensionality of the environment around uh, the metal centers for binding. Uh, so I think those strategies taken together are sort of some of the steps towards selectivity improvements. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to ask a question of my own. Of oh, course, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm very interested in the in the sensing, and uh, I noticed that in your presentation, you have listed several MOFs and COFs with uh, with uh, electron conductivity. So my question is, what would be the ideal electron conductivity of those framework materials being used as a chemical sensors? So in chemical resistive devices, in this imperimetric uh, system, the way that the, the response is obtained is by applying voltage and measuring current. And that applied voltage doesn't have to cause any kind of formal redox event to the framework of the material itself, so long as the transport through the framework is somehow perturbed upon binding. So the driving voltage doesn't offer any kind of like oxidation or reduction. So technically, you know, if you have a semiconductive material and that can be like pretty broadly defined, as long as the properties of that semiconductor are perturbed by the presence of the chemical, um, you, you, you can get away with a pretty broad range. So I'll say from like, you know, 10 to the 
um, minus two to like 10 to the minus five Siemens per centimeter is pretty easy to work with, with common potentiostats and uh, microamp readout of current that can result from like basically millivolts uh, being applied to the device. So in my opinion, you know, for low power chemical sensing, like reading out microamps is very convenient and applying millivolts is also very convenient. So that kind of puts you in like 10 to the minus three range is sort of the sweet spot. Now, if you don't mind like high driving voltages, um, you can work with much less conductive materials, but that means that to read out like a reasonable amount of current, you would need to apply more voltage. Um, on the other spectrum, if the material is too conductive, like it's a metallic conductor, then it is uh, unlikely that the transport through that material will be significantly perturbed by a binding of a chemical. So that that's in the other part of the spectrum that if it's too conductive, you won't see much response. I see, yeah, that's that's very good. So which means we, we cannot work on the on the pure insulator nor a very good uh, conductor, right? Exactly for chemical yeah. resistive detection, but there are other realms of detection where these conductive MOFs are suitable, like for example, as working electrodes in voltammetry. So if this is an electrocatalyst or an electrode, then you want the highest conductivity possible for this to just be a standalone porous electrode type of material. So in that realm, higher conductivity could be highly beneficial. I see. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions that are quite uh, uh, technically detailed. Maybe I can help to answer some of the questions so that Catherine, you can take a, take a rest. So oh, Shiva, yeah, Shiva asked a question about the MOF uh, stability, uh, whether the design of specific types of MOF can be better for such uh, electrochemical applications. Uh, I think a, in, in Catherine's uh, talk, she has demonstrated uh, that some of the coughs are super stable. They can survive in not only moisturized condition, but even under strong acid base condition. So stability wise, it should be fine. However, I personally think that uh, uh, Catherine has mentioned the stability on the high voltage, especially the resistance is high. So that kind of stability uh, may be uh, further developed. Um, so uh, yes, is that correct, Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. And just to also add some of these triphenylene based MOF that are MOFs that are synthesized in water under air, you know, we've shown that like they can be washed in detergent, they can be heated. So those MOFs in particular, you know, within the realm of reason of like typical wearables, um, hold up quite well. Now, you know, if you're going to take this into like very harsh chemical environment, very high uh, temperatures above 200 Celsius, um, MOFs might have, some of the MOFs that I showed uh, may have a hard time. Uh, the cough could be a, a potential candidate, yeah. Yeah, thank you. There are some other questions which I think I can help to answer. Uh, Dara asks, what is the best software to perform XRD spectrum of synthesized MOF and compare with experimentals? Um, there are several uh, software that you can use. Uh, for example, my favorite is the free software called Mercury. You can just download from CCDC and use Mercury to open any SIF file, and then you can simulate XRD. And uh, another uh, software is called Diamond. It's a commercial software and also the Material Studios. And uh, there are many software that can do the, uh, the same thing. So the next question, I'm afraid, Catherine, you have to help to ask. Uh, Simranjit asks, are you doing any simulation studies before the sensor development. I assume that is related with the sensor simulation, right? Yeah, so um, we weren't before um, because we were kind of just looking to get started um, and the empirical evidence can be really helpful uh, for doing that. But also I'm not a computational scientist, but now we have some computational collaborations where we are uh, using computational work as a guide as to what may happen to our sensing devices in the future, how they may be perturbed on the electronic level or what kinds of intermolecular chemical interactions we might expect. Uh, we have a recent paper published in ACS Nano in 2022 on uh, 
electrochemical detection of um, dopamine and serotonin, and there actually we used computational predictions of intermolecular interactions to kind of guide the work up front. I see. Uh, probably the last question, Xiao asked, uh, uh, what is the reason for the selectivity? What are the mechanisms that can be used to explain the selectivity in the chemical sensor? So in chemoresistive devices that I focused on in today's talk, there are two main components for how the sensing response is influenced. One is binding, and two is signal transduction upon some kind of perturbation to the electronic properties. So that binding interaction can be quite selective um, based on the metal ligand interaction that is selected for the analyte material combination. And there, you know, you can rely on uh, Lewis acidity or bronze acidity, hydrogen bonding interactions, for example, around uh, the metal center as well uh, to promote uh, selectivity and sensitivity as well. Uh, but ultimately for signal transduction, some kind of perturbation to the electronic properties is really important. And that could be viewed as coupled to binding, but sometimes it can also be uncoupled to binding in, th in that you can get binding, but if there's no shift in electronic properties, you won't see a signal. So that's also an important feature. So those are the, the two primary driving factors here. I see, thank you, uh, Catherine. There is another suggestion from the audience. Uh, uh, suggestion that uh, in the future, the speakers of the MOF 2024 webinar series can introduce some fundamentals about the material synthesis and the characterization. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we cannot explain all the details in this one hour webinar. Uh, I myself has a, as a class working on uh, porous materials and I spend a whole night, three hours lecture talking about the MOF. But even with that, I can only scratch the surface of the MOF chemistry. I highly recommend you to come and uh, join the MOF 2024 conference in this full one week conference. Hopefully all of your answers can be, all of your questions can be answered. Okay. So with that, thank you very, thank you very much for everybody. And uh, especially thank you, uh, Catherine, for your time and effort. It's a wonderful webinar. Okay. Thank with you, that, everyone. Yeah, for with, yeah, with that, we, uh, we conclude. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.